Hello, good afternoon. Today our guest is Professor Tyler Cohen. Hello, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you, Lipton? I'm great, Tyler. And Tyler, we're going to have an awesome discussion. Do you know why, Tyler? Why? Because of Addison Ray. Addison Ray commands millions of followers on TikTok. She has been featured by the Wall Street Journal and all the major publications in America. What are the implications of the success of Addison Ray, Tyler? It means that academics need to wake up. Recently, Paul Musgrave had a piece on foreignpolicy.com arguing that some are upset that Tyler Ray, sorry, Addison Ray has been so successful, but I'm not surprised. She's selling a product that people want. It is the attention economy. She's a dancer and she sticks out her tongue and that's what some people want. And brands are willing to pay her a lot of money. The economics of Addison Ray must be explored. I'll stick out my tongue if you'd like. I agree <laughs> academics need to wake up. A lot of the world either doesn't care about them or is actively hostile, and they need to engage more in the public arena and be useful. I've tried to do that myself, but I see so many people in the field are simply asleep. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Tyler, I like philosophy and economics, but people are not going to listen to you comment on Karl Marx if you're unwilling to put a different spin on Marxism. It's just like the economics of well-being or happiness. These are topics that most people care about. So you can start a podcast or write articles on happiness, well-being, and productivity in contemporary labor markets. Some academics are literally being fizzled out. And the then they complain. World, you need to get to the point quickly. TikTok most of all. So it's very good training for academics if they're willing to engage on those terms. I think it makes their whole work better. You just get a sense like what matters, what doesn't, what's a relevant question, what don't we know? And what, what I find fascinating is that Addison Ray is not just a girl. Serious people are writing long articles chronicling our success. This is not just some random person we can afford to ignore. She's a I big deal. Of, yes, if I think of my own blog, Marginal Revolution, it's not just the people who read it, but a lot of professional economists read it. So you actually reach more of your peers by having some open presence as well. And then, Tyler, you wrote a book some years ago titled Averages Over. I was expecting you to mention it because we're discussing Addison Ray. But average is really over and we ought to stop promoting the lie that we should adjust. Adjusting is a short-term strategy, not a long-term strategy. As a 22-year-old, you get a job at McKinsey, Wall Street, or even Walmart, and you adjust. But by the time you're 30, you should be transforming that sector. I think, you know, on Twitch and live streaming, you can see it most clearly that average is over. You either are attracting a lot of attention or maybe no attention at all, and not so many people are in between. So there's a, there's a ruthless kind of discipline to those media where I think you have to decide you're going to make a go of it or, you know, do something simpler. Yeah, so for example, it, it's even like social media followerships. I don't pay much attention to social media, but recently I recognized that I'm being followed by some professor and even academic journals, and I said to myself, if one has 20,000 or 2 million followers on social media and you're not being paid to produce, pro, to promote products, you're wasting your time. Sometimes, some, some people like myself, we tend to focus on the quality of the followership and not the quantity. But if you're going to be on social media, it should be for a purpose. Well, if I think of my own situation, I'm not paid to promote products. But uh, you're a famous economist. I read a lot of people read you. Yeah, I'm, I'm paid to write, so people buy my books or read my columns. So I, I have a method that works, but I'm not an influencer in the sense of earning any money from product promotion. Yeah, yeah, I, I get your point, but you still have some influence. But if you're just on social media looking at the dance moves of Beyonce or just idling people, you, you need to get a real job. Social right. media must have a payoff, and as an economist, you believe in trade-offs. And the trade-offs of social media for most people are, are quite low. What is your job, if I may ask? Yeah, so I, I work in Jamaica. I'm, I'm, I work full-time. I'm a researcher, and I'm also a YouTuber. So I work, and I write. And when I write, some, usually I do get paid. But YouTube is a job and a hobby. I do a yes. show, like, every day because I'm passionate about ideas, and I don't Are get tired. in finance? 
No, no, I, I'm actually an academic. Mo- I'm, not, I'm a research and business analyst. I don't research in finance, more historical research, but I like intellectual history. And history is very economical. So when I read history, the student I was exposed to David Landis. I'm a big fan of David Landis. Sure. I knew him from my Harvard days. Yes. But he was a very nice man also. Yes, David very Landis. Open. Yes, David Landis would have been on this show, but unfortunately he died. Yes. What do you like to research the most? Oh, so I'm interested in the origins of trust. We still don't know how social capital and trust are, are maintained. I'm interested in the economics of innovation, the ethics of artificial intelligence, and pre-colonial Africa. Oh my God, we, we don't know enough about Africa. Recently, I, I had a conversation with Jane Robinson, and we discussed Botswana and why Botswana has done so well, even though its, geograph- its geography predicts that it should be a laggard. Those are, per, those are wonderful topics. Uh, they're amongst the most important topics. I, I've always wondered if we had a good explanation for Botswana. I think of it in a way as more of a city-state with mineral resources attached, not quite a regular nation-state. And another key issue in economics is the transition to free market development and culture. So for example, Individualistic cultures are individualistic cultures make a more efficient transition to free market economics, and I believe that this is one of the reasons why so many countries in the developing world have been unreceptive to, to market reforms. It's a cultural issue. Too much collectivism in the underlying cultural background. You think? Yes. Yes. And is Botswana better in that regard? Yeah, historically, Botswana produced stronger institutions that are more democratic, and there was a semblance of market economies in Botswana in the pre-colonial era. But Botswana, during the 60s and 70s, made the transition because of political leadership. The leadership was unwilling to lurch to the left. So for pragmatic reasons, Botswana went right. And how would you evaluate Jamaica along oh, those lines? Well, OK. So, <laughs> Well, I'm assuming that many of us are familiar with the story of Jamaica, but Jamaica is an interesting case. There's a writer called Aaron Graham. He's actually quite brilliant. He has done work on company ownership in the pre-colonial Caribbean. He has a piece on early technology in Jamaica. He has a piece on patenting in, in Jamaica. Jam- the, during the colonial era, the people, the white colonialists, they had some interest in the enlightenment and research and development but for the most part, Beja, the Bayesians are the more productive upper class. The Bayesian upper class is described by one writer as an early managerial upper class. And in Barbados, slaves were brutally punished, but they, they were also treated well when they performed. So we, 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 get, we get a situation where in Barbados, slaves are being prepared for the labor market and they're more and they're prepared more effectively than that of Jamaica. However, in Jamaica, during the 1830s, closer to emancipation, the, the planters would create small schools to educate the future Black population. But Orlando Patterson writes that the Bayesians, they have procedural knowledge. Jamaicans have declarative knowledge. The Bayesians were better able to manage their economy because elite, elite, elite whites in Barbados reposed confident in the Black majority. They were less likely to revolt. And for obvious reasons, Barbados is constrained by geography. So over time, elite Blacks in Barbados decided that it was more su- su- efficient for them to appropriate British culture and institution than to become revolutionary. Jamaica, it, 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 the situation in Jamaica is a bit more complicated, but to the point, in 19, from 1972 to 2007, productivity declined. And because of COVID, we have seen a further decline in productivity. From 72 to 80, the economy collapsed by 25%. And many economists, even left-wing economists in Jamaica, attribute, attribute this collapse to the policies of Michael Manley. The 70s were not good for, for Jamaica. Even without US intervention, the country would have still failed because culture is important. And Michael Manley promoted an anti-bourgeois culture in Jamaica during that time. So older people often argue that it was during the Manley eras when the country took a dive for the worse. And we're yet to recover. And then in the 1970s, there was FinSAC. Some attribute FinSAC to the premature liberalization of the financial sector and recirculation. But the case of the, the point of the story is that over 40,000 businesses collapsed, people committed suicide. And this is one of the reasons why some people will never return to Jamaica and why 
big heavy heavyweights in the private sector have little confidence in the economy. Then in 2007, Bruce Golden was a prime minister and the, the GLP made, made get to the point, the, the, the IMF agreement was not successful. The PMP won com, and was committed to the reforms. Then the JLP won. And since then, the JLP, has, uh, the JLP has been committed to the reforms. So the JLP has been powerful from 2016 to 2020. So both parties are committed to pro-market reforms. The PMP should be left. The JLP should be right. But the, the JLP, like the PMP, is committed to social justice. But the problem in Jamaica is not so much economics. It's, a, it's about low productivity, social capital, low social trust and why work and why people won't work there was a writer his name is ken carter he, he has a book titled why jamaican workers won't work it's interesting and in it he said that selections in jamaica are for unproductivity so people ascribe gossiping to, to productivity so if you're able to gossip or sleep with the boss, you're seen as a productive worker. So there's a misalignment of resources and skills. But I find it interesting that one worker had an excellent boss, but he was still not motivated to work. So this is a complicated issue why Jamaicans won't work. Some say because the private sector is not innovative, and this is true according to the World Bank, the private sector is not competitive. But there are many reasons why Jamaicans, Jamaican workers won't work. One reason is that Jamaica has a scarcity mindset in contrast to an affluence mindset. So there are people in Jamaica, yes, they're poor, and they will say, I am a sufferer or I'm poor. They brag about poverty. And this is not this does not predict economic growth. Countries that have done well economically believe in autonomy. They're more intellectually autonomous. And Jamaica is closer to collectivism on the spectrum. So these are some of the reasons why Jamaica has, has not been able to grow, though it has potential. And do you think Trinidad culturally is any more or less positive situation? Yeah, the Trinidad, so Virgil Stroyer, colleague, has done some research on Trinidad. Trinidad is not different. It's also a low trust society. And there are disparities in levels of entrepreneurship between non-Blacks and Blacks in Trinidad. It is said that in Trinidad, Black people are professional. They want a job and good money, whereas the non-Black black groups tend to value hard labor. So Black people prefer to get a PhD. A Chinese or white man will literally work as a plumber and then progress to become a CEO. And even Elizabeth Wright, who is now deceased, she made the, she's a, she was a Black woman. She made this point years ago. She said Blacks have a preference for high-profile jobs, and it's unfortunate because anyone can become wealthy. So this could be a barrier to Black entrepreneurship in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I am doing the interview. Yes, <laughs> yes I, we're, we're talking about Addison Ray and the, the, the attention economy, but then he decided to ask me about Jamaica, and I just had to give an answer. But I'm not finished with the attention economy as yet. So Tyler, I, I read an article this morning by two young women. Let me go and look at the title. It is titled, The Problem, no, no this is the title. Who's to blame that black TikTok creators are not the ones invited to perform on late night shows? Everyone. So Addison Ray was invited to perform on the Jimmy Fallon show, but she apparently appropriated black dances and people are upset. But my issue with this article is that no group has a monopoly on culture. And historically, groups tend to do well when they commercialize culture. So post the 1800s, invention has not been that important. Commercialization has been more important. So I think the broader issue here is that the, the Black creators may not be so adept at commercializing their culture. And secondly, Addison Ray is a Black girl promoting herself to a multi-dimensional audience, maybe Black creators should appropriate Asian and white cultures because people like exotic performers. What do you think, Tyler? First of all, I don't really watch TV, so I can't- Neither do I. As to which TikTok performers are invited on TV or should be invited on TV. Uh, I am cautiously optimistic about a number of innovations in blockchain space that will allow artists to own their own works and reap higher income from it. So that's an experiment. I'm not convinced it will succeed. I think it would help out a, a large number of disadvantaged groups, including, including Blacks, both in the United States, the Caribbean, and in Africa. And that potential innovation is proceeding very rapidly. We are going to try it. So I think 
for liquidity constrained performers were often given take or leave it offers by intermediaries, like in the old days, a record company, right? You'd cut a ska single and they'd pay you $25 and then they'd get the royalties and the small number of ska singles that hit it big. All the creators ever got was the check for $25. Um, so I think we need to rethink in many areas the role of intermediaries. And also business acumen. So culture is related to business acumen. Maybe many of the black performers are not from the upper class. And an advantage of being upper class is increased confidence. So upper class people may not know Bill Gates, but they will go to every way to meet him or send an email to Bill Gates' manager. Whereas lower class people, as, as the research tells us, they're trained to follow instructions. And Bill Gates is out of very reach, but due to their social constraints, they're less likely to contact Bill Gates. So maybe this is an issue that people from certain socioeconomic classes, they're internalizing negativities about themselves. I think the returns to having some fair degree of confidence are quite high. Yes. There are some papers on this. And uh, I think one way to benefit people is to credibly and plausibly give them more confidence. But, okay, but how do you create confidence at the community level? So, do you have children? Uh, one daughter who just had a baby of her own. She is 31. Oh, so you're a grandpa. Correct. <laughs> so you, you. Know, you, know, you, know, you know a lot about, no, I don't have children. So you know a lot about inculcating confidence in your own ch children and close friends, but how do you build confidence at the community level? Where I'm talking about a group of 5,000 to 20,000 people. When, when groups Often over long... Communities build clubs, right? Yeah. The clubs certify people, and they also boost and elevate them. So I think communities all over the world have done a pretty good job in creating confidence in at least many of their individual members. Of course, you need different kinds of tests or filters, whether explicit or implicit, right? You can't give the certification to everyone. Yeah, and it, some it, cultures, they might certify you for the wrong thing, right? So they might certify you for criminal activity. And maybe you'd have some confidence in the short run, like, oh, I can be a good gangster, but it's not really going to help society, is it? And Tyler, how do you get people to appreciate that there is nothing wrong with being rich? So. Rihanna is a billionaire and a black writer, I believe he's of Nigerian descent. He was lamenting the fact that Rihanna is a billionaire. But I think that being a billionaire is something to be celebrated. Do you remember that study done by William Nordis, Nord the Nobel Prize winning economist? And he said yes. that innovators only get 2.2% of the surplus value of their inventions. So if Rihanna is a billionaire, and they're black. That's that is something to be celebrated. And during my perusal of black writers and conversations with black people, it's hard for, for me to get them to understand that there's nothing wrong with being rich. You don't have to stay poor. You don't have to celebrate living in in, in the ghetto. There's nothing wrong be, with becoming a, an enter, an entertainer and hiring a management consultant from McKinsey. That doesn't make no, I, you I, less I of a person. I do think the country matters. So in the United States, most billionaires really have earned their money. Yes. The people who inherit wealth, then typically the parents earned it. But if you go to Russia, a lot of Russian billionaires essentially became billionaires by using the coercion of the government. And that is less admirable. So people often don't understand that distinction. They think the billionaires we have stole it. it might be true for a small number of them, but I think really pretty small number. But there are countries where most billionaires got their fortunes by illegitimate means. But uh, I'm, 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 and, and yes, and that could be one reason why that young man is so skeptical of billionaires because he views the system to become a billionaire as corrupt. But Ryan Bourne of the Cato Institute does study, and he cited other studies noting that in America, most billionaires do not earn wealth via rent seeking. Correct. And America's quite even before Mike, even before the Cato study was produced, saying that most millennials are first generation millennials, we knew that about 80% of millennials were first generation millennials. The, the American system is more dynamic. You know, there's an old saying about Russia country has too many billionaires and not enough millionaires, which is a sign that there's a self reinforcing power to this coercion. And Russia doesn't have that many millionaires. So 
So small to medium enterprise, in essence, is taxed by the oligarchs, and it creates a small number of illegitimate billionaires. You know, China is somewhere in between. It's not as meritocratic as the United States, but most Chinese billionaires have, in fact, earned that money through hard work and some kind of creation. It may be changing now, but it's been the case to date. All right. So since we're on the topic of billionaires and millionaires, Tyler, is income inequality something that should concern us? Well, I think poverty should concern us. Greatly, I agree. But it's the poverty. It's not the difference between a poor person and Bill Gates. It's the poverty. Like, look at vaccines. Did we care about vaccine poverty or vaccine inequality? Well, we care about the poverty. Some person doesn't have the, the vaccine. That's the way to frame it. Positive sum, wealth creation. You know, try to do good for everyone. If you view it as zero sum, you will fail at wealth creation. And the richest people in 1990 are not just the richest people in 2000. The richest people in 2000 are not the richest people in 2020. So wealth is fluid, especially in America and other Western societies. When we talk Correct. about income and culture, we're not referring to the same affluent people all the time. It can be given away. It can be squandered. It can be lost on bad investments. Uh, someone like Elon Musk now at times is the richest person in the United States. That's pretty recent. Yes, but I, I was speaking to another co economist and he was saying that Elon Musk has his wealth in stocks. He doesn't have physical capital. Well, he owns yeah. parts of companies, right? Yes. And he owns some crypto. He's made some very good calls. He's worked incredibly hard. He's arguably the smartest, most driven CEO maybe in the world, but certainly in the United States. And he earned that good and hard. Yes. And, and he's helping our planet become greener with electric cars <laughs> and Tesla. He's an interesting character. But you, Tyler, whenever you speak, the light bulb goes off in my head. So now I'm wondering, what separates people like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk from other geniuses who have not done as well in business? I think it's what I call a multiplicative model. Yeah. To reach the heights of an Elon Musk or Peter Thiel, you need skill excellence in at least seven or eight different ways. And they all feed together and reinforce each other. And there's plenty of brilliant people who only have like an additional skill or two. But those individuals, their ability to be persistent, to execute, to socially network, uh, to also be very smart, to have people skills, to understand, say, government, you just keep on adding up all the different abilities. It's quite amazing. Peter Thiel is probably the world's greatest spotter of talent ever. Yes. His own skill. He found Mark Zuckerberg. He found Elon. He found Reid Hoffman. Other people. My goodness. Who else has done that? Yeah, and Peter Thiel is also a public intellectual. Very few people can be billionaires and serious philosophers at the same time. Yes. But this combination of a fairly large number of traits for the person in question is like an A or A plus in each regard. That is what you see in these top achievers above and beyond like any one thing they're good at. They're intrinsically motivated. We have data on the socio-cognitive traits of entrepreneurs and I would love for someone to do a study looking at specific entrepreneurs like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk. You know, I'm writing a book on talent. It's due out next May. It's co-authored with a venture capitalist named Daniel Gross. So I am working on this topic at the moment. And this was the reason why I love this show again. I'm often in sync with my guests. Yes. How do you spot talent? What do you look for? All right. So let me tell you what I how the show started at first. So I'm a research and business anal analyst, and I contribute to various publications. I've contributed to Chronicles, Magazines, and I have a few pieces for the Federalist. So I said, all right, I'm having a problem. I don't watch YouTube a lot, but every now and then I may spot a video and YouTube is intellectually inept. I need to be stimulated. So I was speaking to an academic and I said, okay, I'm going to interview you. And I interviewed that academic. And then I got some of my colleagues who contribute to various right-wing publications. But when I decided to branch out of my comfort zone, I deliberately identify academics who are interesting, but not popular. And since then the show has been growing. I've interviewed Robin Dunbar, Richard Nisbet, Eric Kaufman, James Robinson. Great picks. Yeah, Paul got all, I've interviewed all the so-called scary people on the far right and everybody else. 
Yeah, so that's how I started the program. But oh, I spot talent. I like interesting people. So it's not sufficient to be popular. So you're a popular guy, but you're also interesting. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah so being popularity is not sufficient to get a seat on this show. Great. You're doing it the right way. And they also read their studies. I believe that if you're going to interview someone, you should know what you're talking about. And what is your planned career trajectory? Repeat that question, please. Your planned career trajectory. Oh, okay. So for me, I have, well, a long-term goal is that if I generate enough income from either stocks or business or this show, I'm going to start a research organization. That's a long-term goal. Well, it can be anywhere. Per also, let me tell you why I, I, I didn't del- del- deliberately say Jamaica. So again, I believe in the cost-benefit analysis. Intellectual autonomy and individualism predict innovation and long-term development. We established earlier that Jamaica is low in trust, low in social capital, and low in autonomy. I, if I were to start a think tank, more than likely to be in a Western country, preferably America, because Americans are risk takers, individualistic, and they have big ideas. I don't know. Some of us don't. So, yes, some of them. But, yeah, but I don't know if starting a think tank in Jamaica would add serious value. Sorry. Maybe I could make a change, but I don't know at this point if Jamaicans are really demanding intellectual work, they like entertainment. So, they're beginning mm-hmm. to use it, but. In terms of the philosophy and the science, they're less interested in these ideas. But we have produced some brilliant people. One of them is Orlando Patterson. And there's there's another academic. He wrote a biography on Caribbean leaders. His name is Colin Palmer. He wrote, he, he taught at Princeton. Yes. But I don't know if Jamaicans demand serious intellectual work. So I wouldn't. From a cost-benefit analysis perspective, I wouldn't start a think tank in Jamaica. Okay. But, but, but that's the, the, the long-term trajectory. So I'm interested in intelligence. So I would love to know the relationship between intelligence and long-term growth across several centuries. There's a study, but that study only explores the 19th century. So I would love, well, it's hard to get intelligence data on the Aztec, for example, but we could use various measures of civilization complexity as a proxy for intelligence. So that's something that I'm interested in. I think cooperativeness and persistence and durability are often more important than intelligence. I think intelligence, especially by smart people, is somewhat overrated. Well, I, I agree with you to an extent, because if you're brilliant, it means that you, you have the potential to intellectualize nonsense. The, the, what's this name again? Keith Stanovich. He has, he has done some work on rationality and relationship to intelligence and why some intelligent people are rational. Brilliant people are good at exploiting others. And this is one reason why, study keep, why studies keep showing that intelligence is related to pro-sociality. Yes, intelligent people may be nice, but they're nice for a reason. I doubt that they're just nice for benevolent reasons. Yes. So, yeah, and intelligent people also have dark traits. The truth is that we live in a world and we we'll always live in a world that prefers aggression to humility. So I don't know if you're in, are you interested in the evolution of pride? Sure, of course. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there's I can't, there's a book titled The Pride of Success. I'm yet to read, but I read the BBC feature piece, and the writer made some rather interesting assumptions. So, for example, if you're reading a, a blurb on a website, it it will read John Brown is a top is a prominent doctor. He has two PhDs. John Brown wrote a best-selling book. Mary Lee is a top-selling real estate agent. The truth is that if you want people to support your product, you need to project pride and confidence. People really don't like losers. Yes, I agree completely. So we have to strike a balance between pride and humility. When should we express pride and when should we be humble? Once people are successful, they often take on an air of false humility but they're not being humble at all. In essence, they're saying, my success is so great. I have so much to spare, but I don't need to boast about this. It's the most conceited possible thing they could do is to be humble. Yes, and and sometimes humility is overrated. So for example, we 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 all have ambitions and drives. 
And there's nothing more annoying than when someone who's relatively successful is getting an opportunity and he says, oh, I don't need it. Mary can get it. That's nonsense. It's, it's also self-limiting. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, don't, I don't find that to be rather interesting. One writer said that he prefers humility, uh, honesty over modesty. And I agree with him. So, for example, in when usually I would just submit an email to a prospective guest. I am Lipton. I like your research, but then I said, "Oh my God! If I interview Robin Dunbar, I can use his name, and it actually works because okay. there are people, Tyler, who will not come on the show if they are not looking at the list of my prospective candidates and guests." Most people. Well, that's not what they've been saying. When I ask top big name economists, why do you appear on my show? They look at me and they say, well, I speak to all people. That's what they say. <laughs> they don't. They're lying, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. They say, as an academic, it is my duty to educate people and talk to them. That's what they yes. say, Tyler. Yes, well. <laughs> yeah, so, and I'm like, well, my friend is like, no. They'll go on the channel and they listen to you. That's why they, sh they show up on the show. It's not because, oh, they just want to help everybody. No, that's not how it works. But Tyler, back again, I, I like free-flowing conversation, but you, you are a natural guest. So usually I prepare an interview and I know what I'm going to ask, but speaking when speaking to someone like yourself, the conversation is quite free-flowing. But the attention economy is something I really want you to zero in on. Tyler, what are you what are your recommendations for young people today if they really want to make it big you know i think most good advice is context specific but there are two pieces of advice that i think are good for almost everyone and the first is get a mentor or set of mentors who are more established and they can help you and give you some kind of guidance so mentors number one number two Develop a small group of people, peers that you work with. I call it the small group theory. And if you can, try to be the leader. So have your small group where you talk about yes. ideas or write about ideas or yes. group. Those are my two generic pieces of advice that most of the time I think are really just a flat out good idea. I agree with mentorship 150%. I have many older mentors and older colleagues, and I often say to people, well, I expect to do well because I listen to older people, and I get the, well, it could be across generations, but in interacting with younger people, sometimes I get the impression that they discount the advice of older people to their own detriment. So when I was a university student, I got an advice from a lady, and it served me well to secure a job. And every, every now and then we hear a story of a young person. He or she's brilliant, but he's also unemployed. And I often say, I, ha I have older colleagues and I listen to them. Sometimes the young people just need to listen. It didn't take me a long time to get a job. I think that's something that they, they often discount because it is said that, oh, society is dynamic and it's always changing, but some variables remain constant. Respect is important. Making your boss feel good is important. People like innovators, but don't try to be smarter than their boss. What's your take, Tyler? Again, it depends on the exact situation. This gets us back to the context-specific nature of advice. I think one reason why a small group of peers <clears throat> is important, is you can see which of your ideas inspire other people to want to follow them. And you can't really do that with your mentor because your mentor is already established or famous or has a stake and ideas of his or her own. But the small group of peers, the people who are willing to tell you you're full of it, or maybe who want to follow you, that's like a very localized, hyper-local test of what you're doing, where there's feedback almost every day. I, I like your context-specific example. So relatability, this is a term that we have been hearing quite frequently. But relatability as an upside and a downside. On the one hand, we're more likely to support those who relate to us. But on the other hand, the superstar per performers are not relatable. So Rachel Hollis, she said that she's not relatable because her mentors are not relatable. And she has a point. She, her, men, her mentors are really mentored in retrospect, great women in history. And she said that they're not that relatable. Good point. But at the same time, 
originally when Rachel wanted to get support of a large group of people, she promoted herself as their friend, as our as their friend. So when is relatability useful and when should we be eccentric? I'm not sure I can give general answers, but I would say this. If you're looking for a mentor, especially if you're already an outsider, first mentors you find, they will have some defects. They won't be perfect. You actually want to look in part for their defects because their defects help you understand, like, why are they willing to mentor you? You're just some nobody first. So you want them to have a big upside. If they're like perfect, like say Bill Gates is the perfect mentor, like he's not just going to start mentoring someone unknown. So you actually want to look for people with uneven profiles, at least at the beginning, because the upside of their good qualities might be extreme. And you'll learn they're screwed up and adjust for that. Don't just listen to them. So if you see your mentor has defects, whether it's in the area of relatability or arrogance or other areas, you know, think about it closely and deeply. Those defects in some ways might have a broader upside. Good point on mentorship. But I was really looking at the extent to which relatability can either impede or promote success. So for example, People are such unusual characters, Taylor. We like certainty, we like similarity, but we often pay where there's a lot of money. So when does relatability becomes an actual burden? So the some like people like Logan Paul, he's relatable, yeah. but he's also very eccentric. I don't watch him, but I read reviews. So most of us are willing to to support our relatable YouTuber up to a point, but after two year, after three years or so, we want the eccentric guy who's willing to do odd tricks. So when should people make that? I yeah. worry too often that very relatable people, they end up being bent by others. They're like too in sync with the common spirit. So if I see a smart person who is not that relatable, I start thinking, maybe this person has potential. This would explain why they haven't already succeeded. Great insight. Is potential explained why he's yet to succeed? Expound some more. I think this is pretty deep. Again, whenever you're evaluating talent, you want to think through the defects as carefully as the upside. But there can't be no upside, right? Only upside. They're already running companies, correct? Or they're already famous or rich and they don't need you. So you're strategically thinking uh, defects have to be optimal defects that you think you, it can be managed or worked with or other people can fill those gaps. And it's when you say aha to a person's defects, you're really making progress in assessing their talent. If all you have is some bland list of, oh, they're so smart, they're nice, they're charismatic, <laughs> they're energetic, you're sort of full of crap because <laughs> Like, what's wrong with them? You know, if you don't know that, it could blow up in your face. Yeah, so, so, for, so for example, personally, Tyler, I am quite eccentric. I sure. read an article on the philosophical perspectives uh, on debt. I am in at one, well, I'm still interested in the concept up to a point, but at one stage, I was really in, interested in dying. How should we feel about dying? What is the impact of debt on the disease? Obviously, if you're dead, there is no impact. Is that the worst thing that can occur to someone? Most people would prefer death to a lifelong stroke. And because I was so immersed in the philosophy of dying for, from 2014 to 2019, that's five, for five years straight, I went to random funerals and I learned a lot. I learned about life, so much about life. When you die, people don't care if you're rich or smart. They talk about hospitality. And right. love and kindness. And are they crying, right? Well, you, I deliberately did not attend the funeral of younger people because that would be a bit harsh. But I went to the funeral of mostly older people. Obviously, obviously older women because on average women live longer. Sure. But yes, this, that, at the time, that was an interesting case study. And I attended funerals of people irrespective of social class. But I like richer funerals because they have better food. 
Yes. You yes. could write a good essay, what you learned from your five years of attending funerals. Yes. It they, would be they, fascinating. They, they had better food. They have better food. But one funeral in particular was just crazy because the old man died and his relatives were fighting over the money and the daughter was just upset and infuriated because her cousins hated her. So you, you get how you get insight into, into into Jamaican culture and global culture more broadly when you attend funerals. People actually take funerals more seriously than, than weddings. You don't I have agree. to go to a wedding, but you insist that you go to a funeral. Are you a funeral person, Tyler? No, I'm not a funeral person. Uh, but I think you can learn a lot there. And you see the social dynamics when people have lowered inhibitions. Yes, and how they respond. And it's, it's, it's as if it is at a funeral when we really get to know how much the deceased valued how much the disease was valued by his love, loved one, if he was valued any at all? You know, I don't want a funeral for me. And you know why? Why? I think people use the funeral as an emotional way to process getting rid of you, <laughs> forgetting you, and moving on with life. I don't want to give them that chance. <laughs> what I want is to get everyone into a room, my body already cremated, they play Brahms, German Requiem, at high volume, you know, a very good performance of Brahms, and then everyone has to leave and, and no, no words are allowed. They just go away. It's not a funeral. That's my ideal funeral-like event. And no one is allowed to pay tribute to me. All they can do is come and hear the Brahms, and that's it. <laughs> German Requiem is about death. It's a kind of pro-death musical piece. So I'm hoping, you know, my wife or descendants, they don't do this funeral stuff, but I'm afraid they will do it because I don't trust them to adhere to it when I say I don't want a funeral. <laughs> Interesting conversation. And Tyler, about 11, well, not, let me see, about 10 years ago, you did a paper on autism. And in the oh. email, you said that the research has moved on since that paper. And I do agree. But, be, but we know that the, so the psychological and intellectual profiles of autistic people are different from other people. So as an economist, and as someone who's interested in, in business, how should businesses cater to autistic people? Is there a market? Of course, there is. Well, I think autistics are often very high achieving individuals. They have a unique vision. They're often quite willing to work hard and see things through. And in an age where conformity is more important, the relative return to autism is higher. So I wrote this paper about the cognitive strengths of autistic people, uh, which I think are highly varied. They're not always positive on net but in many instances, they're positive. You mentioned the research moving on. There's been an incredible amount of research since then on genetics and autism. I think in broad terms, it supported my portrait of autistic people as being high variants. They're very good at things, they're very bad at things. The whole literature on rare copy variants and their role in autism, I think broadly supports my model but I'm not in every way up on this literature. And frankly, a lot of those papers I find difficult to understand. Yes. They're extremely technical. Yes, I have, I have ventured to, to read quite a few strong in mathematics and genetics, but interesting nonetheless. I, I like to study research pertaining to autistic people because studies do show that they have an inclination for a rationality and they value rationality to a great degree. So some time ago, well, we, of course, you're familiar with the James Demore issue. So James Demore got into trouble for what he said about women at Google, and there were many responses. And one person apparently was upset that one of the respondents was a man. And personally, I only care about the data. I'm not interested in how people feel. So, well, I've never been tested for autism, but I'm, I'm, I'm polite, but I'm really cool. I, I'm just not that emotional, sorry. No, autistics are less likely to commit some cost fallacy. Uh, they're more likely to play rationally in games. They're less likely to commit errors of framing or irrationalities of behavioral economics. Those are some of the cognitive strengths of autism. But I think there's so many different definitions of autism. You know, it's confusing. I don't think there is a really good single definition and the formal legal definition is all about disabilities. So under that definition, the only autistics are the people who are totally failing. And that seems like a, a wrong understanding to me. 
Yeah, they, they really care about eye functioning artists. So one got a Rhodes Scholarship recently. And based on what we do know about the profile of historical figures, some of them may have been artistic, like Immanuel Kant. Maybe he suffered from autism or Asperger's, Asperger's syndrome. And I, I like Immanuel Kant because Kant is very rational. I'm a Christian. And deontological, I wouldn't say that deontological ethics it represent, re represent Christianity because Christianity is based on feeling and affectations. And a deontological world is really a world where we cannot appreciate good or bad. We're basically logical robots, but it is logical. It's better than utilitarianism. So I, I like Kant. I think yes, Kant. I do too, a brilliant thinker, but don't say he suffered under autism. <laughs> uh, if he was autistic, he may have enjoyed it. No, no, not suffered. Not, not, not suffered in right? that like, sense. What a yeah, not, not, not suffered in that sense in terms that you, yeah. you, he was a, I mean, it's a colloquial expression, but, but you get the point. But K Kant was just brilliant. He was a scientist, a philosopher. He, he criticized religion, but he appreciated religion. He, like, he was interested in liberalism. I'm, I'm a big Kant. Well, I, would, I wouldn't call myself a Kantian, but I, I like him. He's just so rational. He was a, an incredible systematizer and also a real classical liberal who cared about peace and justice and world harmony in a deep way. Yes, and so we're going to talk briefly about Hegel because I mentioned Kant. Hegel was really a mystic. Are you a fan of Hegel? He's a uh, mystic. Hegel has influenced me quite a bit. <laughs> I think there are many Hegels. Yes, there is something mystical in his notion of the dialectic. Yes. Parts of a kind of world spirit through the unfolding of history can be read in a purely secular way. I think within Hegel, the man himself, it was a somewhat mystical interpretation. Yeah, but but he, he was brilliant nonetheless. nonetheless. But I, I would like a storybook for children detailing his philosophy because he's really telling a story. He's a, he's a great agree. storyteller. He's basically yeah. saying, okay, this is the essence of Western civilization or the essence of reality. And if you cannot understand Hegel at that basic level, you're in trouble. And he also is a classical liberal. People think of him as some kind of totalitarian because they've read Karl Popper. But yeah. Popper misunderstood Hegel. Uh, Hegel was mostly classically liberal. I, I, Hegel has a broader concept of what it truly means to be free. I yes. believe that if he were alive today, he would see the value in some form of left-leaning progressive philosophies. But I wouldn't call him a leftist in the American sense today. But he had a broader concept of what it means to be free. He was interested in civil society and how freedom was realized through the development of the state. You know the story. Sure. You know, I would say the point I made before when looking for talent, you need to understand the defect. Very Hegelian point. I think one reason people misread Hegel, they hear this quotation in English, the state is the march of God in the world. The mistranslation of the original German, which I cannot cite offhand, but it says something very different in German. What, what, what does, or oh, you can't set it off offhand, so, okay, I won't ask. Oh, it's something like, as es der Staat auf der Welt gibt, ist uh, der Gang Gottes, or something like that. It's not how the English sounds. Uh, I think what he is saying is that, that we have this whole process of forward movement of which state is indeed a part. That is the unfolding of a will of God. But it's not putting the state itself above individuals, as I understand it. It's looking for a reconciliation of state and individual where they can blossom together, I think. Again, I, I don't have the German completely correct for you. Well, well, I, I don't. I, I like to interview German scholars. I don't speak German, but we this, this this should take us back to Saint Augustine and early Christian philosophy because they argue that the state is a necessary evil. Naturally, God did not envision a state. So, Hegel has a good point. Maybe at the time people weren't smart enough to appreciate what he was saying, but the man and the state must interact. And sure, and keep in mind, Hegel is writing about a very different kind of state. Yeah, yes. So Hegel's state has the Industrial Revolution behind it, and St. Augustine's state did not. So that makes a huge difference. Hegel's state can do more evil, as did, say, the Nazis, uh, but in some ways do more good, like eradicate a lot of infectious diseases. And the, the Augustine concept of the state 
was in conflict with society. So, and this is why I laugh when people say that Jesus Christ was a socialist. There was a book, Christianity and Anarchy, written by Jacques Ellul, and he argues that Christianity is closer to anarchism than, than, than socialism. Properly understood, Jesus was a revolutionary I wouldn't, of, of, of the anarchy. Well, not anarcho capitalist mentality, but he was a revolutionary. If you're a true Christian, you can't, you should respect the state, but you're not the subject of the state. The final law is the, is the will of God, and it's moderated by the state to an extent. What kind of Christian are you, if I may ask? I, I was baptized in a Protestant church, mm -hmm. evangelical. But okay. I have some. That's appreci still what you belong to. Yes, but I have some appreci appreciation for medieval. From, from medieval scholasticism because I see the Reformation movement as anti-philosophical and anti-rational. If you read people like Luther and Calvin closely, they sound mystical. Remember, the medieval scholastics were willing to debate the nature of angels and God and the world. And Calvin and Luther, even though Calvin has essays and articles on freedom, they sound very angry and fanatical. Yes. So I think the Protestant Re Reformation is actually misunderstood. The medieval scholastics, by uh, one, one good writer to read if you are not reading him is Eric von Liden. Are you familiar with mm -hmm. Eric von Liden? Yes, I am a big fan. Probably Why don't you? Not. Yeah, I, I am. A, yeah, so he wrote The Menace of the Earth. He has a book on mon the Men liberty and monarchy. That's one book. And he has another book I read recently. Let me look at the title. Leftism from Marx. Let me just look at the title. Lifted him from Marx to Marquis de City. I think that's the, the, the name of the of the book. Yes, that's the name. And he can yeah, lifted him revisited. That's the name of the book. He delves deeply into some of these issues. Eric Van Liden. He was a he, he was a European aristocrat. Great, thank you for that. Yeah, and what is also interesting about Eric is that he said. The God of the Bible is not egalitarian. Inequality is even in heaven. We will not be rewarded equally. <laughs> yeah, he was really a, a, a polymath in every sense of the word. William Buckley liked him. But Tyler, in the email, I also said that we we're going to talk about your book, The Complacent Class. Yes. So this is where we're heading now. What is so complacent about Americans today? Or is it just the elites? Well, I wrote this book before the pandemic, and the pandemic is a special circumstance. I would say put that aside, but our elites are very smug and self-satisfied and often risk averse and highly conformist. And they belong to a part of a kind of religion of conformity based on highly educated, left-leaning, somewhat self-righteous posturing. That I think is the complacent class in the United States. Do you know why I think that elites in America are complacent today? Well, except Peter Thiel, but many of them are not starting new organizations to rival the Russell Sage Foundation or the Guggenheim Foundation. They've been successful and they can rest on their laurels and their living standard is very, very high and they are praised by people all the time. They have accumulated wealth. To be complacent is a good life, right? It's not an accident that it's so popular to be complacent. But nonetheless, from a social point of view, I have long believed we need more innovation, more disruption, and much more intellectual nonconformity. Well, uh, Tyler, if you appreciate intellectual nonconformity, you're going to love this show because I've interviewed him twice and he's quite adept at not conforming. He's a bit of an eccentric. The Englishman, Ed, some of his views you may not agree with, but he's a respectful scholar and has recanted his own academic arguments in newer articles. His name, his name is Edward Dutton. Say the last name again. Edward Dutton, D-U-T-T-O-N. Oh, I don't think I know his work. So Yeah, it, 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 yeah people have been hiding Edward Dutton, but he has written on everything from feminism to intelligence to genius. To, to, to ethnocentrism, he's just to religion and intelligence. He's just brilliant. He, Send me uh, what you think is his best stuff. I, I will. So, Ed, and he's all, and what I like about Edward Dutton is that he's high in terms of general ability. 
this is someone who studied theology. He did a PhD in religious studies, and he has managed to, pr to produce his work in highly rep reputed journals like Intelligence. So I think that's I'm commendable. To read it. Yes, you, you may not agree with, with, with all of his views, but you're a logical e economist. And if, as someone who's always on the cutting edge of research, he's a dissident academic that you cannot afford to ignore. If I agree with all his views, it will bore me, right? E exactly, sir. Yeah, you're not complacent like other people. Yeah. Not Tyler, to say. T Tyler, you don't have to like people and agree with them. I can disagree. Like people is overrated. Exactly my point. You should like yes. what they bring to the table. Yes. So for so I, I contribute to, 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 to mydis.org. I'm a libertarian and I have some interest in anarchism, but at the same time I'm I'm nuanced. I'm not going to dismiss someone because he prefers what we call state capacity libertarianism. I just don't have time for that nonsense. Not at all. And based on the data, I think libertarian was the Cato Institute, two people from Cato penned a response in a journal, but it wasn't polemical. But I think that libertarians need to pen a serious response to state capacity libertarianism because the data and many studies are suggesting that there's a strong link between pre-colonial centralization and modern income. Yes. So this is an issue that libertarians must confront. Tyler, I don't, yes. I, I don't that you are as pessimistic as Robert Gordon. But, beside, but beyond Robert Gordon, there have been empirical studies arguing that it's getting harder to discover innovation and we're less dynamic. Some attributed to complacency. One, one scholar argues that the West, in a sense, has reached its peak of productivity because the economy is so complicated obviously it's going to be harder to innovate and maybe we, we may need less innovation because we're at a very high level of development what's your own take i think we are breaking out of the great stagnation right now exhibit a is the vaccines against covid they do work they are phenomenal i think also when it comes to green energy and other developments in biomedical science like Curing people of malaria, having an anti-malarial vaccine, curing people of sickle cell anemia. I think we're seeing major advances happening right before our noses. And most likely the stagnation of the past, it lasted for decades, but I think, I hope it is now over. And this, yeah, yeah. I think so. And, and this is why we must read Joel Mokir. He's like one of my favorite economists. Joel yes, Mokir, at, uh, yes, he's a genius. I would love to get him on the show that Joel Moker is arguing that because of the epistemic basic knowledge, we don't need to worry about reverting to archaic ages. That's the difference between the post-industrial era and the past. During the post-industrial era, it was less likely for innovations to peter out because we had a better knowledge base. And that, and I agree with him. So the vac some people are skeptical of the vaccine. My own issue with the vaccine is that more research should be done. People with COVID can still, people, people who have been vaccinated can still contract the disease and transmit it. And most of us, when we get a vaccine, we don't want to catch COVID any at all. So I think that there is more room for research. But again, we're unable to get the type of research that is demanded due to conformity. So maybe there's a brilliant person on the vaccine team saying, guys, this is what you really need to do. And the others are saying, no, it won't work. Keep in mind, it's the best studied vaccine in human history. And protection against death and hospitalization is pretty strong. Just so you know, I need to go in a moment. I have to yes. get a COVID test shortly. Not that I think I have COVID, uh, but I have an overseas trip. Okay. I need to be tested. All right. So, Tyler, I'm going to just allow you to go. So it was a pleasure to speak to you, Tyler. COVID cut our interview short. <laughs> All right. Well, let's try this again sometime. Very nice to make your acquaintance. I'm glad to see you're a fellow eccentric. Yeah. And don't let them try to set you straight. You know. All right. Thanks stay for true the... to who you are. Yes. Thanks for showing up. Bye. All right then. Take care. Bye. Yeah.